The information provided in this podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be considered as personal advice. Always consult with a qualified professional or expert in the relevant field for personalized advice tailored to your specific situation. You need to stay invested because if you get paralyzed by what you read in the papers, mm-hmm. if you're paralyzed by the issues that we're facing around the world geopolitically, then you actually miss opportunities. Mm-hmm. Risk is more than just on or off. You can actually manage that risk. You can actually dial up risk and dial it down depending on your circumstances or what your financial goals. My father had levered the family's wealth into the crash of 87. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Wealth Guide, sponsored by Riker Capital. If your fund is consistently staying on that trajectory and delivering on that objective, it also gives the end client certainty that, you know what, I can spend this money. I have permission to spend this money because my investments are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that's my job, is to make sure that the range of possible outcomes is very narrow, so that way we deliver along the glide path. And I think there's a really good article the other day about how a lot of Australians are retiring with actually too much money because they were too conservative or they didn't feel confident enough to actually go and spend the money they rightfully worked their life to use. Now, what is today's topic? Really, really excited to dive into unpacking and understanding a very important business resource that our financial planning practice and our advisors utilize to really grow the business, work with referral partners, and to actually provide really excellent advice uh, to clients. So very excited to have um, our guest, and I'm going to introduce Nathan now, Mr. Nathan Lim, who is the Chief Investment Officer of LawnSec Holdings. Hi, Nathan. Hey, Tamar. How are you doing? <laughs> welcome, welcome. You can tell we have a similar accent. We ca- <laughs> confirmed that we both originated from Canada. Um, Nathan from the West Coast, Vancouver, and me from the middle of Canada. So that's quite exciting uh, and have been in Australia, obviously, for quite a while. Who else is on the couch today? Of course, we have the principal and senior advisor, Mr. Ray Regmi. Hi, Ray. Good day, Tamar. Thank you. I'm <laughs> super excited to have Nathan here today. I'm pumped as well. We've got so many questions for you, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> so have you... Had a good breakfast and well hydrated. <laughs> this is Let's go. Be, Let's this go. is going to be very insightful. Also on the couch, senior advisor, Mr. Dean Dasuki. Hi, Dean. Good how morning. are you? Good morning, tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Excellent, excellent. Well, I'm going to start off, Nathan, with uh, reading a bit about your bio uh, that I got from the bio you sent, but I really want to deep dive into your career because it's been very, very interesting. So, Nathan, let me see. Um, so, you're responsible at LawnSec, I understand, for building and managing LawnSec's suite of investment solutions. Uh, devising strategies for growth and acting as a liaison with the marketplace. So that's what I know so far. Can you kind of flesh out a little bit more about what you do at Law and Second? I'd be very interested to hear about your career thus far as well. Okay, so a bit about me. So I joined Lawnsec uh, late last year. I was previously working for a little firm you may have heard of called Morgan Stanley, uh, where I was working in their wealth division. <laughs> a little firm. Yes, I have, I have heard of it. Nathan. <laughs> I, was, I was head of wealth management research for Morgan Stanley in Australia. And then for almost uh, about 18 months, I was up in Hong Kong running their manager, um, ma- manage, uh, manage discretionary investment management business. Uh, but before that, I've, I've pretty much been a fund manager for my entire career. A mm-hmm. um, couple of notable call outs. Um, when I was back in Toronto, I worked for Sprott Asset Management. Uh, I was with Eric Sprott when, uh, when when Barron's ranked as the number one hedge fund in the world. Um, when I eventually made my way over to Australia, I was running an LIC uh, for Van Eyck uh, at the time. Um, and then moved over to lead Australian Ethical's global equity portfolio. I ran mm-hmm. that for about six years and was fund manager of the year in 2014. But then when I eventually got over to Morgan Stanley, um, they asked me to help build out their multi-asset capability and, and their focus on providing holistic advice. And it was there where we built out the Morgan Stanley multi-asset solution, which IMAP ranked the number one multi-asset solution in Australia in 2021. So. What I bring to LawnSec today is a lot of that experience around risk management, around building portfolios, and ultimately working with clients and getting the right outcomes. You can see why we're very excited to have you on on the couch, (laughs) and really as a very, very important resource for the business. So I'm very excited uh, about that, and thanks for fleshing that out. So how about your career right now? What are you passionate about or focused on at this stage in your career? 
I'm, I'm still very much focused on just getting the right outcomes. Um, I, I, we were talking earlier about about my history and my background, and you, you, you're sort of were sort of alluding like what got me into this line of work. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, I've got a kind of a funny background because, in the sense that when I was 12 and my brother was 17, my parents went back to Malaysia, and my brother and I were kind of left to sort of fend on fend for ourselves, right? Oh my. <laughs> and the, right. One, there was a there's a there's a broader backstory there, but one of the key incidences during that time time was that my father had levered the family's wealth into the crash of 87. And so I have had a front seat at uh, poor financial decision making very early in my career. Mm -hmm. And that's always sort of been in the back of my mind is that um, you got to you kind of want to avoid doing those sort of big all or nothing by no meals sort of uh, decisions. Mm -hmm. And yep. you really got to think about risk. Uh, mm -hmm. Risk is more than just on or off, you can actually manage that risk. You can actually dial up risk and dial it down depending on your circumstances or what your financial goals. And what makes me, what what's passionate for me is really how to connect all that and help people achieve their goals. That is interesting. I know I, I'm going to date myself. Um, when I really started entering the work workforce, it was right after the, 80, it was actually a couple of months before the 87 crash. So have lived through a couple of those as well. So I definitely yeah. have, have mm -hmm. felt that too as a very, very young person uh, living yeah. through that. Can you please tell me a little bit about Lonsec? So we have, just to give you more context, we've definitely had um, other people um, come to the, our podcast who have represented, you know, insurance platforms, um, uh, investment bonds, uh, platforms, superannuation platforms, and then how they've actually supported and worked with the advice team to really produce, you know, really good relationships and growth for our business partners and our clients. Can you give me an understanding of what your business does? Yeah, sure, Tamara. Uh, yeah. So the way, the way that we talk about Lonsec is that we actually sit at the intersection of all those players, mm -hmm. right? So we sit between financial advisors, asset owners, product providers, and regulators, right? And we basically are that interconnecting tissue that facilitates the conversation that happens between all those two groups, all those four, those, those different groups. Mm -hmm. But specifically for financial advisors, our service or our products to them really revolve around providing data <clears throat> and, and tools and solutions. And what we mean by that in terms of like data and tools, the best manifestation of that is our iRate platform, which is our mm -hmm. inventory or our data base mm -hmm. of securities and research across uh, thousands of uh, Australian Australian funds, ETFs, and, and direct securities. In terms of solutions, and this is part of the business that I'm involved in, is where we s look at managed accounts. And mm -hmm. so in terms of managed accounts, we provide the whole suite of solutions. Everything from your sort of traditional multi-asset income, uh, responsible investing, sustainable solution mm -hmm. through to tailored, or what we recently just launched our tailored at scale solutions for, for, for bigger groups. All the way through to the other end, we have an MDA solution, which will then allow <clears throat> financial advisors to actually fundamentally transform how they deliver advice to their clients. So mm -hmm. the, way I, the way I sort of sum it up is that when it, when it comes to financial advisors, we're very much B2B. We're here to help financial advisors help their clients achieve the best outcomes. Well, that's a very good segue, Ray. Mm -hmm. so now that mm -hmm. we heard the context that, that Nathan has provided, what are your views on working with and using that support and that tools, all those tools, et cetera, uh, you know, in your business? Um, look, I think they're, they're, they're fantastic tools, Samara, because ideally what it does is gives us a bit of insight, not only that data-driven research, to see what the portfolios are going to do and how the markets are going to look like potentially in the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. It helps us guide through those uh, through those tough conversations with the clients. Mm -hmm. When you're having the conversation around the superannuation retirement or investment money, mm -hmm. how that's going to perform, what does it look like? Ultimately, it is about taking the longer approach for the, those kind of investments, but it just helps us paint a little bit of picture mm -hmm. and having those conversations with the client, well, what does it look like in the short term, medium term and the long term? Yep. So that kind of tool really helps us drive those deep, meaningful conversations with the client mm -hmm. and what outcome they should be looking at. That sounds good. I was reading on, no, that, that does make sense. I was reading on the website too, Nathan. One of the things that popped out at me uh, is talking about helping businesses meet their, their business obligations. Is that... Yeah. Uh, is that a compliance thing? Is that a, a you know a, a, an outcomes thing? What what does that mean as far as your service to help advisors like Dean and Ray uh, do so that kind there, of thing? There's two elements to that. Yeah. Uh, first of all, there there's the element of know your product, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so something as simple as providing research. Mm -hmm. So that way, when a financial advisor goes to a client and says, I like XYZ fund, mm -hmm. we are providing that research for that advisor to say, yes, 
I actually understand what I'm what I'm actually recommending to you. So that's on our research side. Yeah. On the solution side, which is again the the Lonsec Investment Solutions, where I'm from, what we focus on is actually looking at the objective that is stated on the tin. So when mm -hmm. you say that a fund has a CPI plus two percent target, <laughs> our objective is that's that's what we have to deliver against. Right. And so we are constantly always measuring ourselves against objectives, and it's between those those are those are probably the primary er areas where we support advisors, providing them with that knowledge and that education to better provide to provide good advice mm -hmm. and at the same time to help provide solutions to help meet uh, financial objectives. That sounds really nice. In that context, so Dean, you and I were talking about that, that mm -hmm. in the office yesterday, kind of preparing and, you know, what we were going to talk about at today's podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. some of that you did bring up about, you know, making sure you're meeting your obligations and understanding. Um, can you kind right. of flesh that out a bit of what you're talking about with me yesterday mm -hmm. in that context? Yeah, so um, exactly like what Nathan is saying. So we obviously utilize these fund reports because it gives us a very good understanding and you'll be quite surprised how detailed it goes in as well. So mm -hmm. it even goes down and assesses the actual fund manager who's actually running it, uh, what's their investment strategy, what's their investment objective. Uh, it breaks down to the extent as well with how, what's the, what's the, what do they feel that the market's how it's tracking and what may potentially be some strengths within having this particular fund, mm -hmm. what are the potential foreseeable weaknesses and it gives us a very very good analysis of the full uh, investment um, so that at least it allows us to not only provide the best possible solution for the client um, but clearly see what the fund is looking at doing and, and how it's going to look at tracking but second to that it's also a bit of a compliance risk really mm -hmm. like for us it's, I was just thinking yeah, risk yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 thinking the same thing <laughs> well, I was pretty much quite, well, going to Nathan's team there about the risk because ultimately <laughs> we are we, when we're sitting in front of clients we just you just don't get that kind of time to mm. go create a portfolio mm -hmm. and measure the alpha or beta in a portfolio. You just don't. That's not so, really what so your primary role is. Exactly. Is it? Yeah. Um, so I suppose that sort of um, creation of those portfolio the, um, or the model portfolio solutions really provide us that comprehensive solution to the clients to go, well, this is a research-based portfolio. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And this is what it looks like based on your risk profile or your risk outcome. Yeah. So it provides a really good sort of compliance measure to not only cover ourselves, but also offer a good solution to customers. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, even when I'm picking on with both of you, and it'd be great to unpack it. It really is what are the roles. So a financial advisor needs to be, as everybody's stated in the in the room as well, needs to be across this and understand that. But primarily, an advisor is meeting with clients, really understanding their situation. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yep. Um, understanding their goals and obviously matching the solutions. So to actually do all of that and then somehow be responsible for all this research. <laughs> I mean, I, I just can't see it happening. So for me, that's why this is an excellent, I guess, business marriage and a necessary one. Yeah. And it tomorrow, doesn't... actually, just to, just to pick up on that as well, the the, the research part, I, I don't think, I think you cannot underestimate just how much work goes into that. And that's yeah. something that Lonsec is very proud about is that independence with our research. And even mm -hmm. internally, there is a giant information barrier between the solution side of the business and the research side of the business. And right. I, I just one very simple example. When research publishes their their view on a fund, I only will start looking at that report after it's published, and then that helps form my universe of funds that I will then select from. So any fund that is recommended or highly recommended comes over the information wall, and that's when we get involved and start doing the deep dive and then start figuring out, okay, mm -hmm. which one of these 50, 60 products do we want to put together to create a solution, right? So you've got two layers coming from your business before it gets to the advisor exactly. stage so that you have, uh, you're able to disseminate it in, a, I think, a very efficient, practical way. Well, that's like, exactly right. So, for example, you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that first layer, that's actually potentially going and speaking to the fund managers. Not potential. Is, that's uh, that's mandatory. That is what it is. Okay. okay. So, yeah. that's the whole first stage. And yeah. then it comes to you. Yes, is that that's right? right. That's right. And so, okay. it gets it gets passed over to us. And like mm -hmm. I said, it's it's very much the research department is its own entity. Okay. Right. right. And, so they're um, on the ground. They're on the ground. ground. Yeah. They're, they're, they're doing the work. They're saying yay or nay, good or bad, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. recommended or, or investment grade. And what we when on the LIS side, we use them as a quality filter, right? So basically, we're just really focusing on their best calls. What managers do they think are the best in class for that asset class? Mm -hmm. 
And mm-hmm. of course, then people say to us, well, you know what? You can actually have two or three managers that are highly recommended. Well, then how do you pick one? And then yeah. that's where that second mm-hmm. layer of due diligence comes into play when we start thinking about portfolio construction, yeah. right? So we mm-hmm. might find mm-hmm. that one manager has got more of a tilt towards value versus growth. Mm-hmm. That factor mm-hmm. preference may be why we may select one over another, just as one example. Dean, you and I were also talking about yesterday, uh, for example, and maybe you can go into it. So sometimes having clients uh, uh, come to you and they already have a portfolio, let's say, and it might be in their self-managed super fund or their exposure in their super fund, or they might have a bit of a portfolio going on, you know, outside of super and thinking that they have diversified. Can you give me that example? It was more of a, I thought that was really intriguing. It'd be great for Nathan to weigh into that. No, the uh, the funny thing is, is um, sometimes when, especially with the generic type of funds, um, you might, they've got different, they don't have a massive range of investment options. Um, um, but they've got different risk appetite investment options. Mm. Um, so what tends to happen is, is that the client will choose two of those funds, for example, like a balanced one and a, and a, and a high growth one, and they're <laughs> under the impression that they're diversifying and they're spreading their risk. Yes. But then the reality of it is that it's 90% of the time, they still got the same underlying investments, but they're just skewered with the uh, risk side of things. So even though sometimes it may look like it's a bit different, Different. This is why it's important to say something, having that research behind it to really unpack what's in within each single one of these investments. Mm-hmm. It's um, That's how you're actually able to really clearly articulate whether, whether it's really identi- uh, diversified. So. Mm-hmm. I pick up on that as mm-hmm. well, Dean. So one of the one of the elements that we as a firm tried our commitment to to you guys, financial advisors, and I like to describe it as you guys know the ride the client wants right yep. and so i i describe that as either they want the duck ride or they want the roller coaster yeah. <laughs> and, and honestly well, and, and if you think about it that 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 ties into stage of life right mm-hmm. so if you're really young you're just you're, fr- you're fresh out of school you just started working you've got your whole career ahead of you yeah. that you can take a little bit more volatility you can get on the roller coaster right but if you're into your 70s mm-hmm. you're ready on your pension um, you need that certainty. You're not really gonna get on that roller coaster. You want the duck ride, and Correct. so our commitment to you guys is that when we deliver solutions, that's the first thing that we're thinking about. We want to make sure that the risk profile, the volatility of the product matches what's on the tin. So either deliver you the duck ride or the roller coaster mm-hmm. so that when the bad day arrives, and nobody can ever predict when that when yeah. that bad day will come, either you'll go half X or you're going to go 2X. Yeah. But the quid pro quo is that on the upside, you either get half X or 2x. Correct. And exactly. I think that's the that's what we are focused on when we're trying to deliver the right portfolios yeah. to you guys mm-hmm. is protect you on the downside but also make sure that there's upside participation but in the context of are you on the duck ride or are you on that yeah. roller coaster? Yeah. Right. Well, that uh, maybe segue over to to uh, yourself, Ray, because Ray, you do have people in different life stages. Well, you do, so you've yeah. got the younger people and you've got the more mature age people. So does that? I imagine that really resonates. It, it absolutely <laughs> does, Mara. I think it's it's at some time it's also very conflicting because I've got the retirees who also wants a bit of a bit of a roller coaster, a bit of a duck. I'm going you have to manage oh, that. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you can't really have the both over here, but uh, yeah. but I suppose yes. The uh, my my question always to them is going well. If, if your portfolio was to go down by 10% tomorrow in retirement, mm. how would you feel? Mm. And I think that's a very really tough pill to swallow sometimes. <laughs> yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah. But of course, when you're dealing with, say, large family offices that yeah. are like endowments mm. where they have a perpetual uh, time frame, yep. they don't mind because yeah. there's, there's a, again, it's, it's circumstances. And this is why the advisor is so important in the exactly. relationship yeah. because they're able to assess the needs and the circumstances mm. of that client and then say, okay, given what I know, this is what you should do. And so this is where Launsec supports them in that decision making. Yeah. And, and just, just for clarity purposes, mm-hmm. I'm like, we do use a variety of different asset managers and obviously Launsec's mm-hmm. been um, a big part of uh, what we do, but also, mm-hmm. um, you know, when we look at other portfolio solutions, they've, they, we look at different sort of uh, life stages, if you like, different sort of li- uh, yeah. risk profiles, if you like, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. what are some of the investment outcomes that client want personally. And then we sort of try to match the best portfolio solution based on that. Mm-hmm. Um, so suppose what Nathan mentioned over there, uh, as far as the, um, the portfolio st- structure goes with an accumulator as opposed to someone on the pension side mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. going to vary quite a bit mm-hmm. not only that there's a cost aspects of, of it so there's a core portfolios and you've got some of the active portfolios but mm-hmm. they might be a little mm-hmm. bit more expensive so there's a bit of an alignment on that side as well mm-hmm. so it's trying to match up a whole different variables that the clients want from a portfolio solution mm-hmm. and matching that 
best of uh, the portfolio solution to that name. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was thinking too, because even when we've talked and Nathan in, in a previous podcast as well, I mean, people are going into, I guess, semi-retirement, retirement, and they have a longer lifetime or more years now on average in, yeah. that, in that stage. Yeah. And so there is, and what I'm picking up, it'd be great to have comment from all of you guys is really, if I'm, let's say, retiring at 67 and I might be transitioning, I might still work part-time for a while because, you know, I'm still feeling pretty healthy, et cetera. But I could be in that stage for 20 years, maybe even 25 years. So I can't be too duck in your words, <laughs> uh, but also, uh, you know, I don't want to be too roller coaster. Yeah. Uh, so, so really the importance of having those tools and understanding, exactly. you know, have, having that tool set for the advisors to really pick that out through my journey, even in that later stage in life yeah. is really important. It is, and I suppose I'm like you're just going to pick a very happy medium, have any tomorrow. Look, mm, um, sure. it's 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 you finding where your comfort zone is. Yeah. Um, for suppose for someone like yourself in that uh, in, in our sort of client base, it would be more around um, measuring that risk to go. What are you comfortable with? Yeah. And you might do even different bucketing strategies where you've got a little bit of money in the cash set aside. So even mm-hmm. if the market was to go down, you've got you've got still got sufficient money in that cash bucket. Because you're drawing some money from your investments money at from, that stage. Exactly. So yep. it's not really going to impact your portfolio because you've still got this uh, long-term view that you're going to work for another potentially 5, mm-hmm. 10, 15 years. Yep. Um, you can draw from that cash bucket and let the market recover. Exactly. So, and when you go over to that, and endow- like you brought up the endowment. So if you're in a situation where it's there's the, there's no timeline, so there's a portion of that money with no timeline, yep. that's kind of you wanting to make sure that money is working really hard because you're not doing that drawdown, et cetera, on capital. It's got yeah. a particular function and then you exactly, need to have the tools exactly. to do and, that and, as well. And, and to bring it full circle tomorrow, I think this, <clears> this is why it's so important why you need to look at the objective of the of the fund that you're going into. So yeah. just again, a lot of people benchmark themselves against CPI plus one, two, or three percent. That's right. If your if your fund is consistently staying on that trajectory mm-hmm. and delivering on that on that objective, it also gives the end client certainty that you know what I can spend this money, mm-hmm. right? I I have permission to spend this money mm-hmm. because my investments are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing, and I've got, and that's that's my job is to yep. make sure that the range of possible outcomes is very narrow, so that way we deliver along the glide path that mm-hmm. was advertised on the tin. Mm-hmm. And I, I think there was there was a really good article the other day about how a lot of Australians are retiring with actually too much money because they were yeah. too conservative yeah. or yes. they they didn't feel confident enough to actually to go spend and the to money. spend the money that yeah. they rightfully entitled, they, they worked mm-hmm. their life to use. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I think that's part of that equation about giving comfort and giving certainty mm-hmm. to advisors and ultimately making their, mm-hmm. making its way down to clients. And so, I, mean, I can echo that actually. I'm like, when you see some of the client scenario situations, they have saved a, a substantial chunk yeah, of amount of money. they worked because, hard and they've got the investments. Yeah, because yeah. I think um, for the most of the part, I think the 2008 GFC crisis sort of played in their head quite a bit. Of course, yeah. of course. I mean, they've lived through that moment, so they're always forever scared mm. that what if that would happen? Yeah. Do you, do you guys realize it's been more than, it's almost 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. That 15 is incredible, years, right? actually. It feels like yesterday. Right? <laughs> know, yeah. But it's like, it wasn't a long, it's, it yeah, was a yeah. long time ago. But it's always been a constant reminder. And yeah. because mm. it was such a historical event, yeah. Yeah. no one's let go of that event. Well, or most people have at least. I don't know. I, I would say you let go. You remember it, right? You remember because it. I, I was around for the dot com crash. I was mm-hmm. also around at the start of my career for the Asian financial crisis. Uh, that was the first time <laughs> the word financial crisis was used. So yeah. I've kind of I've kind of seen it like three times on on a front row seat. Mm-hmm. The, the funny thing with these things is that they kind of rhyme, right? They do. You, you can feel it, and especially in, in the most recently with this COVID crash. Um, we were very aggressive to get get defensive once we realized that something was wrong. And I remember when I was back at my previous firm, we were looking at Chinese power coal consumption. And so if you guys are familiar with Chinese New Year in China, yeah. basically the, the country just shuts down for like a week, right? Mm-hmm. So nothing happens. And so what typically happens is you get, you get a V-shape in po- coal consumption because Everybody stops working and then everybody starts working yeah. again, right? And then so after the uh, Chinese New Year, and what was it, back in 2020, we noticed that Chinese power coal consumption wasn't coming back it because of this down. thing called the coronavirus, yeah. right? Mm. And then that's when the alarm bells started going off because we realized that China is such a big part of the growth narrative back then mm. that their economy was basically standing still. So mm. we, we got very aggressive and we were cutting. And it, it's it's those points in history when you just get that aha moment, when something yeah. really material tells you that something is broken, something's wrong. 
Yeah. And, and this was, we were early. We started selling out of positions in February and, and uh, early, late January, early February. The market, I think, put the bottom in late March. Yeah. And then immediately after that, by around April, it switched. It, because the recovery was it, very sharp. The recovery was really sharp because you realized again that governments and central banks around the world were doing unprecedented amounts of fiscal and monetary yeah. stimulus. And that was going to save the day. And yeah. so you have to just recognize those really big levers. And, and the thing is, they don't happen every day. You no. don't get earth shattering changes, but you have to watch every day yeah. and you have to just observe every day yeah. and just look for those big mm -hmm. events. And see, that that is so important because for our customers to have that kind of research or that mm -hmm. kind of support in the background where, when, where, where we sort of see customers, sort of new customers coming in, not knowing what their portfolio looks like, what their construction or the makeup looks like. Mm -hmm. It's just so important to have the right structure of portfolio in place because when you have events like this, it provides that layer of protection because you've got someone keeping a constant eye and watch mm -hmm. on it mm -hmm. to go how these market events are going to impact their portfolio for retirement. Well, that's entirely sure. So that's to really right. summarize what I'm getting as a, as a lay person who's mm -hmm. not an investment person, who's not a financial advisor, it's really the ability of the financial advisor to rely on the, what did you say, the sticker on the can? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Because you're making those adjustments as as that resource and, and, and watching the markets, et cetera, so that in the modeling of outcomes, Comes, we can we can rely on that sticker can to do that modeling if we're going to choose certain um, certain funds etc with that outcome for the end client so you can rely on that to your point it's happening in the background that's happening you guys as financial advisors are using that relying on that modeling it out to really deliver on specific yeah. outcomes yeah. that I as an as a client am, am asking for absolutely. is that the interplay am I getting that, that right is absolutely that's but I think important. ultimately you've got this goal that the customer gives to you from their mindset to go right yeah. Yeah. this is what I want to do. This is what so I need. you have this yeah. huge responsibility from a client's perspective to go, if I don't get this right, mm -hmm. I have completely shattered their retirement goals. Mm -hmm. And you carry that massive pressure on your head going, mm -hmm. okay, Joe wanted this, this, and this event to happen. Mm -hmm. Based on this event, this is what he should be doing. Yeah. And you sort of forecast and play that out based on the right portfolio solutions. Exactly. Haven't you? So, uh, yeah. I'm picking up the reliance. No, yeah. this is a really, really good interplay and really good to unpack it, you know, to, to our end. Before we actually close this off, I'm going to I'm gonna segue to, I read something else on the website oh, here, yeah. and I'm going to ask for your comment on it because I think all of us want to hear from, from your perspective. So what I read, this is something that came out, I think it was February the 9th. It was a market. It was about market maintains momentum was the headline. And what it said, it indicated that superannuation funds, which all of us are involved in super here in Australia, had a really good start in 2024. Yep. And uh, it was the Research House Super Ratings. They estimated the median balanced <clears throat> option generated a return in January of 1.1%. I wouldn't mind you kind of unpacking what that, that meant and why it was on the website and why that was highlighted. And, and, uh, yeah, sure, tomorrow. So th again, this, this really speaks to that, what we were talking about earlier about that intersection yep. of how Lonsec uh, deals with a lot of different financial players. And so this is very much coming out of our super rating business, which is led by uh, Kirby Rappel. They, they basically provide a lot of quantitative and qualitative analysis around the super industry, right? That, yep. So that's that's our thing. Right? And we work a lot in super, yep. yeah, don't we? And, and, and we're, we're definitely a leader in that space for, for providing, research, uh, yep. providing research solutions to them. But what's notable about that, that report is that if you just cast your mind back to this, this time last year, Right. And you think about how everyone was a lot of people were kind of paralyzed with indecision. Yes. And the markets were weak and it was it was just bad. Right? Yeah. It was, it just was bad, a bad headspace. Right? Yeah. But <laughs> funny enough, in FY 20 in 2023, mm. the average balance super fund ended up returning 9.6%, yeah. which is yeah. like, wow, right? yeah. no, what, what a great outcome. I'd right? say that's pretty good for a balance. When we say yeah. balance, what are we talking about? Just to give the, the audience some context, what is balanced? Well, here's <laughs> what a funny, here's, about? It's, a really, it's a really good question because there is no official no, answer. Okay. Right? Okay. Okay. I think, again, <laughs> no, it's, it's, we all laugh about it, but yeah. it's, it's actually quite, quite terrible in the sense that, again, what is written on the can yeah. in this particular case is a bit disingenuous. So uh, okay. lots of people call their product balance yeah but there is actually no definition of what is balance so I, it's I'm very thinking, important right i'm thinking this yeah, yeah. i'm thinking so balance, like balance. A seesaw. <laughs> and so you have to so the next layer is you have to look at the fine print on the can right, right. and so our fine print mm -hmm. at super rating is that we define balance as any option 
where the split between growth assets mm -hmm. and defensive assets, yeah. so growth assets make up between 60 to 76% of the overall portfolio. So right. that's how we define balance, okay. all right? And so it's very important that whenever somebody says, hey, I saw this fund do better than your balance option, make sure it's apples and apples, right? right. Make sure they're not taking a pure growth option mm -hmm. that is perhaps 100% growth assets, right? Because mm -hmm. obviously growth assets and defensive assets have got different roles to play in your portfolio. Sure. The, 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 the easy explanation here is that defensive assets help to reduce volatility but it helps preserve capital and helps underpin your income it's got a different role than your growth assets which is about capital appreciation mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and so if you're trying to say well my car goes faster than yours well that's true because I'm riding a bicycle that's not a fair yeah. fight, right? And exactly. so you always have to be uh, make, making those those fair comparisons. So just, sorry, so just to bring a full circle, yeah. why was that number so important yes. was that it just reminded people, one, that you need to stay invested, right? Because if you get paralyzed by what you read in the papers, mm -hmm. if you're paralyzed by the issues that we're facing around the world geopolitically, then you you actually miss opportunities. Yep. And so that's mm -hmm. why you need to be, you need to stay invested. And number two, Super Ratings is talking about a balanced option. So what we're talking about is a well-diversified portfolio. Okay. And that's the other element of it, is that be invested, but be invested in the right ride that is suitable to your circumstances, right? Mm. And that always results in a well-diversified portfolio, either tilting more towards growth assets or tilting more towards defensive assets. Sorry, I'm going to jump in here. Mm. No, Nathan, how often does the in underlying asset allocation change within the uh, balanced portfolio, if you like? Would there be a shift between the Aussie equity and the uh, international equity, um, perhaps even more towards defensive asset side? Is there... Is there a number that you stick to, or perhaps is there a, a range? A, a range? There's a range. Yeah. There's, there's a range. range. Yeah. And so the idea here is that remembering, um, so there's two elements. I'm going to answer the question in two ways. Number one, the ride that you pick is the ride that you should stick in. Yeah. Right. So that means when they're, when you have, remember I told you about that bad time, when you have a market yeah. crash, you are in the duck ride. It doesn't mean that you suddenly flip out and then get back into another ride because then you're trying to market time. Yeah, and yeah. then you're trying to do market timing. That's where you can really make some bad mistakes. And the classic example is that a lot of people were in the roller coaster. Most people are in the roller coaster. Mm -hmm. It goes off the cliff. Then they switch into the duck ride. Yeah. The yeah. roller coaster takes yeah. off <laughs> and they're all still sitting in the, it's still sitting in, in yeah. the duck ride. Yeah. And that, that of sitting too much in cash. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that mm -hmm. time and time again. Yeah. So it's very important for you to be in the right ride. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Now, me as a active portfolio manager, I have some control over the ride itself, meaning that I can either amp it up, but still keep it within a sort of a level of volatility. And that typically is, so let's just use the example of our, 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 our balance portfolio. Our, and it's 50-50, right? Yeah. So we're 50-50. And within that, those, the, the growth bucket, we will be plus or minus 10, 15 percent, okay. right? So what you won't see is a growth profile suddenly becoming more like a defensive profile and then morphing into a, a growth profile, right? Yeah. It, it, it stays within its lane. Those parameters, yeah. yeah. Now, the only reason we ask is because obviously when we do the risk allocation with the clients, obviously there's a conversation around the parameters to go, well, how, how much of the parameter are you comfortable being shifted in or out of? Yeah. Uh, and sometimes that can vary from customer to customer. So you always got to be mindful of that conversation yeah. to yeah. go, what is then going to suit that conversation and the product type of that customer? So it's good to know. Um, yeah, no. No, no, that was good. I, that was a long question I was going to go into too. So really, there's two things I'm pulling out of this. Correct me if I'm wrong. Two things. The first one is the stay invested. Yep. <laughs> Don't sit on the sidelines. So and, yeah. and also to make sure that you're working with a financial advisor who is relying on the tools from, you know, a resource like yourself, uh, Nathan, to understand what lane is appropriate for you for, for your outcomes. Yep. That's what I'm really picking out, out of this. Absolutely. And to add yep. to that tomorrow, I think look at what you invested in. Mm -hmm. I think the, the most important part is, does that suit what you invested in? Just don't blindly go into a mm -hmm. form of a uh, superannuation investment, think that this is gonna suit your needs. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. here you are sort of the next 20, 30 years of your working life, you just plowed away into an investment that may not have been the right structure for you from the beginning. From mm. listening to everybody on the couch today, I'm thinking it would be foolish not <laughs> to use the professional resources and, and, and the team and how it blends together to really yeah. get better outcomes for, for a person as well. Nathan, thank you so much for coming Pleasure. today. And of course, thank you, Ray. And thank you, Dean. Thank you, really Tara. appreciate it. Uh, thanks, thank everyone. You. I hope you enjoyed that. And we'll see you at the next uh, episode. Yeah.